We are searching for the thread of Ariadne, so that it can guide us along the right path and act as a beacon in the darkness. We would love to know what our fate will be, just where we are headed. But the truth is, there is only one path through all times, predetermined by the beginning and by the end, which is also the beginning. Happy Heresies and welcome to the Desert of the Real. Hope you dug that message from the Gnostic-minded show, Dark. Yes, time is confusing, and time is like an Ouroboros. As Augustine said when questioned about what time is, If no one asks me, I know what it is. But be certain of this. Going back in time with the same passion as knowing yourself is the way to see the entire Ouroboros. Follow the thread of Ariadne to leave the labyrinths of the Demiurge. You're a time traveler. Uh, I prefer the term time prisoner. As the Gospel of Thomas says, the disciples said to Jesus, Tell us, how will our end come? Jesus said, have you found the beginning then, that you are looking for the end? You see, the end will be where the beginning is. Congratulations to the one who stands at the beginning. That one will know the end and will not taste death. You'll do this again. Time is a flat circle. I said, Nietzsche, shut the fuck up. Put it down. That's the problem today. New Agers go, Wah, wah, the past doesn't matter. While secularists don't want to look at history, both factual and mythical, to see the entire Ouroboros. Mark Twain said history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Once we find that rhythm, we see the code of the Archons and feel the healing vibrations of the Song of Sophia. Sure, the past can change, but our theurgy lets us see all possibilities and grab the right thread intuitively. In short, Gnosis is about self-knowledge, and that includes knowing our ancestors, our culture, our entire species. As William Faulkner wrote, the past is never dead, it's not even past. Our forefathers, our trauma, the sins slash victories of our tribe are always talking to us, attempting to elevate us or provide cautionary tales. And so it goes, and so it goes, and the book says, we may be through with the past, but the past ain't through with us. Yet we're losing this communication in these Gnostic times and Philip K. Dick world. The Karens and Katamites in the establishment want to erase, modify, and cuck our history, or at least tell us it doesn't matter. And that's a primary reason the collective consciousness today is so fragmented and neurotic. The definition of woke, Orwellian rhetorical prestidigitation that supports segregation according to race, gender, and sexuality, it pits minority groups against each other in ever more elaborate hierarchies of privilege. But we're fine. We of the broken places. We veterans of a thousand psychic wars. We surf the coils of the Ouroboros and see all directions because our pain has taught us the power of the crossroads and the salvation of the trickster mind. As Charles Stein wrote in The Light of Hermes Trismegistus, Hermes is the very principle of the mind in all its possibilities. From heights of intellectual and contemplative brilliance to the daily cognitive life of each of us. From a cosmic principle of creative vision to the cognitive capacities of birds, fungi, and microbes. 
brain drives our thoughts, our behavior. It holds all of the secrets of the universe. The secrets of the universe? There's a whole hidden world inside each one of us which only needs to be decided. So welcome to A.M. Byte. I, Miguel Connor, am truly honored to be once again your pompadus of gnosis and psychopomp across the coils of the Ouroboros, playing in the maze of time and encountering the past with the bravery of Athena and the guile of Prometheus. Sir, this is a Wendy's. Self-knowledge is knowledge of the past. Heck and heckity. It's just having a strong grasp of history. Factual and mythical, as I said. That's what we'll do in this eternal now. Focusing on Eurasia. It doesn't matter where you stand on Russia. It really doesn't. What's more important is that knowledge of Russia. Historical and mythical. To overcome the war pigs. It's hard to hate someone you understand. We've been covering a lot about Russia lately on Aeon Bite. To continue this call from the Aeons, we have the pleasure of being joined at the Virtual Alexandria by Christopher McIntosh. He will discuss his new and fantastic book, Occult Russia. You're going to be blown away by Christopher's research, and you're going to see more of the Ouroboros. We could only do about an hour, as the scheduling Archons have been very active in 2023 for some reason. Saturn is on the rag, I guess. We are decoys brought into the world by an unloving god and driven to destroy ourselves by the uncertainty he creates. Worry not, subs, for as a bonus, we have an engaging section from past interviews with, once again, you got it. Gary Lockman. I mean, in esoteric conferences, many of us quipped that Gary should be the Pope of occultism because of his tireless, brilliant research. Furthermore, Gary has put in much work on decoding the Russian soul and psyche. So get ready for his ideas on Rasputin, the Rus, Alexander Dugin, Putin, Egregores, Greek Orthodoxy, and so much more. Oh, those Russians. The past is not past. History rhymes. To find the ending, we must go to the beginning. Using the trickster mind of Hermes. Or else we're doomed. If we stay the course, we are dead! We are all dead! I mean, it's funny how today, so many, quote, brilliant thinkers like Scott Adams, Jordan Peterson, Noam Chomsky, Nassim Taleb, and others have become bumbling fools. Old men yelling at the clouds, wishing it was 2019 again. It's funny how scientists and government officials seem buffaloed by reality, madly fumbling for the right solutions without much luck. Repeatedly, we see this today because they have all become disconnected from the past, from hermetic or magical thinking, turning senile with scientism and sterile in ingenuity. We Gnostic-minded ride the Ouroboros while they are being crushed by its coils, as is most of society today. You think Einstein walked around thinking everyone was a bunch of dumb shits? <sighs> I hadn't thought of that. Now you know why you built that bomb. And it makes sense to an extent. Many studies have shown that the easiest people to fool are the educated and intellectual of society. The educated and intellectual are almost always drawn to titles, hierarchies, established systems, and yield to and give weight to them. To learn my teachings, I must first teach you how to learn. This relates to, quote, having faith in such, and therefore doing whatever is directed by such, even if it seems insane. As George Orwell said, some ideas are so idiotic, only an intellectual would believe them. Okay, let's all be good little automaton droids and believe everything we hear on TV. The more educated you are, the more incalculated to the, quote, just believe the system mantra. 
the same system that has rewarded them when they blindingly went up its various ladders to proper employment or reputation. Magicians often say scientists make the best audience because they think they're too intelligent and observant to not trust what they see with their own eyes. Ricky Jay, the sleight of hand master, once told 60 Minutes that, quote, the ideal audience would be Nobel Prize winners. They often have an ego with them that says, I am really smart so I can't be fooled. Yet no one is easier to fool who are blinded by hubris. No way! Or, as Michael Malice said, the easiest dog to train is the smartest dog. And many smart dogs today have been corrupted by the Wetiko mind parasites. The Aussie man is here. Be the smartest man on the sender. I'm not saying reason is bad. Far from it. But we shining crazy diamonds know that reason has to be part of a psychic ecosystem. That includes street smarts, our intuition, and the daemon or higher self. And the lessons of the many past that aren't past at all. Remember that quote at the beginning from Charles. It's all about the mind of Hermes. I can handle things, I'm smart. Not like everybody says. Like dumb, I'm smart and I want the stint. So let us to our interview with Christopher McIntosh. Oh, but first, some Sophia from when Charlie Rose interviewed Ray Bradbury, and the author explained how we can unite reason and mysticism, which is the natural state of any whole human. Write your own gospel, live your own myth. What is space travel going to do for man? Space travel is going to enable us to live forever. That's its most important function. Yes, we wish to guard the gift of life. Uh, Kazan Zakis puts it very well in his most remarkable book, which no one has read, very few, few people have read it, uh, um, The uh, Saviors of God. And in the book he says, God cries out to be saved. We go to save him. That's what space travel is all about. In this part of the universe, God has wakened on this planet and shaped himself the way we are shaped. We are the flesh of the universe which wishes to know itself. Well, that's great. That's responsible. That's beautiful. It's a very nice concept of religion, one I'm very uh, comfortable with. I like to think of myself as part of the universe waking up and looking around saying, hey, this is remarkable. Look at this. I have all these senses. I'd like to keep this gift going. You find no conflict between religion and science, then? Well, absolutely none. They are, uh, the, the processes they're going through are, almost, are the two halves of a coin because everything ends in mystery. I mean, the scientists have theories and the theologians have myths and they're the both, both the same thing because we end up in ignorance. We don't know what gravity is, we have theories about light, but they're only theories which are being revised. Even Mr. Einstein is coming under scrutiny again in the last few years with some of his theories. These will be revised and changed in the next 100 years and again 100,000 years from now. The important thing is we should gather as much data as we can, as many facts as we need, and on these, based on theories which help us to survive and where the mystery begins theology takes over so it's two halves of the same coin we have to think about the unthinkable which is what religion does and science does too at times trying to figure out what in heck's going on you know how did we get here where did we come from where are we going we don't have the answers and we never will have them so we make do with theory and with theology and with the two of them as tools one to work with the basic facts one to take up where the mystery begins We'll make do and go on into the future and live for three billion years in space. Not just here, but on on out to the stars. That's what space travel is all about. This is the Aeon Bide interview. And with us, we have the pleasure of being joined by Christopher McIntosh to discuss his new book, Occult Russia. Pagan, Esoteric, and Mystical Traditions. Christopher, thank you very much for coming on the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. Pleasure is all ours, and yes, really enjoyed your book. And with us, too, we've got the Moondog, Vance Sachi. Vance, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine on this rainy California morning, and I'm looking forward to learning something about Russian spirituality, something I know almost nothing about, so... 
There is a lot. I mean, I, Chris's book was uh, very good. I, I, of course, uh, we've done shows with Gary Lachman on his book, Occult Russia, uh, Dr. Stephen Flowers on his book, The uh, Occult Roots of Bolshevism. But Christopher, your book is certainly as essential and at the same time complementary to all this great research on this uh, vast and rich religious tradition, esoteric tradition in Russia. So uh, how did you uh, come come to writing this book? Well, before writing Occult Russia, I wrote a book called Beyond the North Wind, which was basically about the legend of Hyperborea, the legend of an ancient civilization in the far north. And I discovered that this legend was particularly strong in Russia. So I included a couple of chapters on the Russian Hyperborean movement. And this led me to realize that there were many other interesting esoteric currents in Russia that really deserved a book to themselves. So that's how I came to write it. Yeah, as your book showcases, the Russians have been obsessed with Hyperborea, Shamhala, and other yes. sort of idealistic place, just like here in the West, we talk about Atlantis or something yes. like that. So uh, why do you, is there a reason? Is this part of the culture that uh, there's been this sort of obsession? Or is this sort of like a, a human uh, thirst for some ideal place? Well, this is one of those things that I call egregores, an, an, an egregore being a collective thought form created by many people thinking the same thoughts and focusing on the same ideas and symbols. And there are a number of these egregores that are very strong in Russia. Um, I have a, a theory about the reason for this, which um, is that these, these egregores, these, uh, these motifs, are recorded in um, some in, in invisible etheric realm, um, similar to what in Hindu tradition is, is called the Akasha, or um, the British scientist uh, Rupert Sheldrake calls it the field of morphic resonance. Uh, at, at any rate, my theory is that in Russia, the veil between this realm and the everyday realm in which we live is thinner than in other places, um, which is why these, these things are particularly strong in Russia. Um, now, one of them is this concept of, of a never-never land, um, a faraway paradisical place that is difficult to access, except, except for those who are worthy to, to find it. And um, there are various examples of this. One of them is Bielovodje, the land of the white waters. Another one is, is Hyperborea, the, the, the northern uh, paradise. And um, the, 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 this notion of Hyperborea is particularly popular in Russia, and it's, it's linked to a whole mystique of the north in Russia, the Russians at a certain point, came to think of themselves as a, a northern, um, a northern people, and um, it's partly a reaction against the idea that civilization came from the south, that um, it, it all started somewhere in the Middle East and then went went by Greece and Rome, and went further, further and further north, and um, at a certain point, there, there were certain Russian thinkers and, and writers who said, no, um, civilization came essentially from the north, uh, from this Hyperborean civilization. And we, the Russians, are the true inheritors of this civilization. So <clears throat> there have been, for example, a number of archaeological expeditions to the far northwest of Russia, uh, bordering the Arctic ocean and some very interesting things have been found prehistoric remains pyramids and labyrinths um, remains of paved roads and things like that so um, there is 
there's some evidence that um, there might have been some sort of precursor civilization in the north. Uh, so this has really taken hold in Russia. And um, there's, for example, there's a whole school of painting um, where various Russian artists have produced amazing visions of Hyperborean cities with people traveling around on sleighs pulled by mammoths and, and this sort of thing. Um, so, yes, yeah, so this is, this is one of those egregores. Uh, I can mention a few others, if you like. Oh, yes, yes, because uh, the one of the questions I had, Christopher, I was thinking, well, is there any, like, foundational myths for Russia? But as you write in your book, Russia is so multicultural. There's so many yes. streams, religions, movements. It's, it really is a gigantic melting yes. pot. You couldn't say you know, like uh, the founding fathers in the United States or or uh, Remus and yeah. Romulus in Rome or something like that. Yeah, so, yes. uh, but you put it, couching it in terms of egregore memes as the mind virus makes more uh, sense. So yeah, let's talk, let's break down some of these other egregores that influence the entire Russia. It seems, uh, what, the, the woman clothed with the sun is a perennial one? Oh, yes. Well, that's that's a very powerful one. And um, <clears throat> this basically goes back to the book of Revelation, where um, there's a passage which talks about a woman clothed with the sun who appears and is going to give birth to a savior. Um, and there's a dragon, um, <clears throat> a seven-headed dragon, who is waiting to devour this savior when he's born. But the archangel Michael comes and defeats the dragon. And um, yeah, so this, this figure of the, the, the woman clothed with the sun um, took hold in Russia and it, it um, captured people's imaginations and it, it merges with various other female figures. For, for example, Sophia who is the, the feminine aspect of the Logos, representing wisdom. And she's a very important figure in orthodoxy. When, when you remember that the, the great church in Constantinople, uh, which was for centuries the, the center of orthodoxy, the, the church there is dedicated to Saint Sophia. Um, and there's a whole tradition of so, uh, Sophianic mysticism within, within Russian Christianity, and um, this this woman clothed with the sun cr crops up in in other ways. For example, as as Mother Russia, who, who was in, invoked during the Second World War um, to mobilize the Russian people against the German invasion, because <laughs> Stalin realized that the communist ideology. It just wasn't strong enough to do that. Um, a much more powerful, something much more powerful was needed. So this figure of Mother Russia was invoked and the posters appeared everywhere showing a, 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 a radiant woman waving a sword and, and a slogan which said, Mother, Mother Homeland Calls. So um, all of these things are variations of this woman clothed with the sun. Uh, then there, there are a number of other, the number of other egregores, the, um, the warrior hero who's typified, typified by a legendary figure called Ilya Muromets, who's rather like King Arthur in the British tradition. Um, and um, you get actual historical figures who act out these, um, these roles of, of the egregores. So um, an example in history of the warrior hero would be uh, Prince Alexander Nevsky, who uh, defeated the Teutonic Knights um, in, I think it was the 15th century. Then um, there are, there's, uh, for example, um, the holy fool, or the, the fool for Christ, which is, this is something very Russian. This is um, a saintly person who adopts 
an apparently mad way of life of extreme austerity. Um, an example was Saint Basil, who went about naked even in the depths of winter, um, and doing good works, healing people, and so on. And Saint Basil's Cathedral in Moscow is named after him. And um, you, may, you 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 asked about a, a sort of a founding theme. Right, right. Yeah, but before we we get to that also while we're you mentioned the woman clothed with his son i think it's important all the examples you give which are amazing like the uh how the russians really equate gaia with sophia which is more a new thing here in western occultism uh the the goddesses they have like parafskiva and yeah, how this div- yeah this divine yeah. feminine appears as these uh wonderful female saints like saint matrona of moscow who yes. healed people in the 20th century and uh, was able yeah. to avoid the soviets he was so yes. yeah this divine feminine is very important in your book uh gives plenty of evidence yes yes so can we say there's a founding myth for russia or we just yeah, have to yes. stick to agricores I, I, <laughs> I would say I, I i would say if there is a founding myth it's the notion of holy russia holy russia and this really goes back to the time when Russia was converted to Orthodox Christianity in the, the 10th century by Prince Vladimir. And at that time, uh, the, at that time, Constantinople was really the spiritual center of Orthodoxy. But uh, towards the end of the 15th century, Constantinople was overrun by the Turks. So uh, after that, uh, the Russians began to develop the idea of a third Rome, the, the, the first Rome being the Rome on the Tiber, the second being Constantinople, and the third being Moscow or Russia. So um, Russia, in, in a way, began to see itself as the heir, the true heir of the, the Orthodox tradition. And in fact, the, um, the the country that was 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 going to be a, a spiritual light to to the whole world. So I, I would say that's really the that's really the founding um, myth or egregore of, of of the Russian people. Another, um, well, I don't know about egregore, but symbol that is also prevalent in Russian history is that of the firebird. Can oh, you yes. explain some of its manifestations? Yeah, well, this this is a very beautiful legend. There's a famous ballet called the Firebird Suite uh, with choreography by the choreographer Fokin and with music by Stravinsky. And this firebird appears in many folk tales. It's um, uh, a, uh, a beautiful bird with uh, fiery plumage, and it has the ability to confer good fortune or, or bad fortune if you, if you treat it badly. And um, there are many folk tales in which a hero goes in search of the firebird and um, eventually manage, manages to grab hold of a feather of the firebird, and the, and the feather confers um good fortune on him um so it it's a little bit like the 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 grail the concept of the holy grail in uh, in the, the the um western european tradition and uh, there are many it, it appears a lot in art it's it's a it's a favorite um theme for for, for example those um lacquer boxes that uh, that you see in Russia, which often have a, a picture of a firebird on them. And there was a, there was a, um, a famous expatriate journal um, among the Russian diaspora in California, uh, which was called the firebird. Fascinating, very fascinating. And uh, what's interesting, uh, another feature, too, about uh, the Russian psyche, as you 
uh, point out in your book, Occult Russia, is that unlike other places in the West, Christopher, Russians will make uh, a writer or an artist into a bona fide guru. I mean, he's yes. right there. It's like to, like here, if we made uh, Ernest Hemingway and Stephen King into spiritual leaders, but there it just happens, right? <laughs> yes, yes, it's it's really expected of them, and um, it's it's a role that they play. Very interesting. Yeah, this has been the case um, throughout the history of Russian literature. Um, writers like Pushkin. Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, um, Solzhenitsyn, you know, right up, right up to the present day, really, and filmmakers as well, filmmakers and, and artists. Well, personally, I think that's a good idea because uh, writers also are like shamans; they go deep into the unconscious that's right. for uh, for yeah. different things to find yeah. the to slay the dragon, to bring back treasure, everything. Poets, definitely poets for sure. Yeah. Yeah. On a little side note, uh, I, you have visited Russia and you actually saw Lenin's tomb. I think that's cool. Yes. Tell us about that experience. 1992? Yes, I, I first went to Russia in 1992, uh, just after the fall of communism. And um, it, it was a good time to go, actually. I went to St. Petersburg and, and Moscow. It was a good time to go because... The infrastructure was still in place. Everything worked. People were very friendly. Um, we went to beautiful places, um, and it was all quite magical. And one of the places we visited was Lenin's tomb in Red Square. Uh, this was a rather bizarre experience. Um, I, I lined up in front of the tomb, and um, I was asked to remove my hat before I went in. Wow. I, I processed into this this dark interior with um, this eerie figure of Lenin's body um, spotlit and um, uniformed men standing guard around it, and it was it was as though I had the feeling that it, it was as though where when communism had collapsed everywhere else that this was the last little cult of, of communism left with, 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 these, um, with these faithful acolytes guard, guarding this dead body. So that, that, was, that was the feeling I had. Wow, what an experience. Yes, I, and I guess Lenin is still waiting to be revived like Walt Disney. I mean, isn't that the idea of these early Bolsheviks? They really thought they could conquer death and space and all that. <laughs> well, that, that that's that's right. There was one famous, one famous man. Um, um, what, was, what was his name? Fyodorov, I think. Um, I think uh, Sergei uh, or, or Nikolai Fyodorov, who um, this was in the nineteenth century, towards the end of the nineteenth century, who um, believed that one could reanimate all the human beings who have ever lived um, through their cosmic dust. Um, and he wanted to turn the earth, turn the earth loose from the solar system and make it into a kind of space spaceship that could travel through <laughs> through space. Well, it, it all sounds completely mad, but Fyodorov in fact had a considerable influence. He was um, one of, I think, the founding member of a, a movement called the Cosmist Movement. And he did, he did, in fact, have immense knowledge. And one of the people he influenced was a man called Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who, as a young man, went to sit at Tsiolkovsky's feet and virtually received a whole education in physics and mathematics. And Tsiolkovsky then became a, a brilliant physicist and mathematician who made all the calculations that enabled the, uh, the, the Russian space program to get started and the Sputnik, Sputnik to be launched. So he, he, he played a very key role in the Russian 
space program, and it, and it, it goes back to this this man Fyodorov, who a lot a lot of people would would have considered to be a madman. <laughs> Didn't he inspire the father of rocket science in Germany? I forgot the name of him. Uh, uh, you mean uh, Werner von Braun? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, I hadn't, I hadn't, hadn't heard that, but it could be true. Yes. Yeah, I believe there are there are stories of a uh, of a uh, yeah he having copies of the book and so forth. But yeah, it's interesting because you're talking about the Russian Silver Age at the in the earliest 20th century where you had this sort of Star Trek mentality and yes. this sort of utopian drive at any cost. I mean, that was a, that was quite an age, don't you think, Christopher? <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, it was. Yes, the, the Silver Age was um, a very brief period um, from about 1890 up, up to the beginning of the revolution. And um, it was an extraordinarily rich period, uh, both culturally and and in terms of esoteric movements. Um, there were all sorts of things going on. Uh, there was, um, I think, in, in 1905, an edict of toleration, which put an end to the monopoly of the Orthodox Church. Um, over the spiritual life of, of Russia. So this, this was one of the reasons why all these es esoteric things flourished at that period. So um, you, you had, for example, Theosophy, which was founded by a Russian woman, Madame Blavatsky, in New York, but then it quickly found its way back to Russia. And there was the, the anthroposophical movement of Rudolf Steiner. Um, Gurdjieff was in the early days of developing his movement, the Gurdjieff work, along with his follower, P.D. Uspensky. And um, there were certain writers who were very influenced by these movements, like Andrei Bieli, um, and um, composers like Alexander Skriabin, who um, was very influenced by theosophy. And after reading Blavatsky's Secret Doctrine, he was inspired to write a symphony called Prometheus poem of fire, and uh, he also planned to create um, a, an amazing, what, what would have been an amazing work, a sort of total work of art called Mysterium, which was going to combine music and poetry and drama and dance and spectacular lighting effects and so on. The plan was that it would be held in a hemispherical temple in India over an artificial lake so that the audience would have the impression of being enclosed in a great sphere. But um, unfortunately, Skriavin died before this could be carried out. Um, great pity. Yeah, I agree. Would have been an incredible show. Yes, yes. Well, there was also, there was also a great um, interest in Oriental religions. There was a, a, a very active Tibetan Buddhist community in St. Petersburg. And uh, there was a wonderful Buddhist temple that, that built there, which is, which is still there. It was restored after, after the fall of communism. And um, in the visual arts, there were painters like Nikolai Rurik, who was uh, not just a painter, but a, a mystic and a visionary, along, along with his wife, Helena, who was a channel. She channeled messages from one of the ascended masters of theosophy called Moria. Um, and there's a big movement, movement in Russia today. But of, of course, um, this um, came to an end. Well, it didn't, it didn't completely come to an end with the, the Bolshevik Revolution because some of these continued um, after the revolution. Um, but when the Stalinist terror really got going, um, that really put an end to um, to this uh, this um, silver age of um, of culture. Yes, indeed. And uh, as you talk about or you write about, even in the early days of Bolsheviks, even under the eyes of Lenin, you had movements like the Red Rosicrucians, the Order of Light, of course. We've yes. got Antoly Lunakarsky. He was a 
uh, one of Lenin's right-hand men who was a Freemason and symbolist and was all about God building. So yeah, this sort of occult vibe was there. But as you said, uh, uh, Stalin started putting the screws on everything, not the Greek Orthodox Church, the cult, yes. everything. <laughs> yes, indeed. One of the um, surprising names that comes up in connection with um, Rosicrucianism is the film director Eisenstein. And um, you may have seen in, in the book, I included a photograph of him with fellow Rosicrucians right. during, during the Civil War. Um, so he's, he's not someone who would, he's not someone would not normally associate um, with a Rosicrucian order, but, um, but he was a member. And he was, uh, and he was a member of the Red Army, so, which is another interesting thing because you, you you wouldn't have expected a communist to be to be interested in Rosicrucianism. What about you, Vance? What do you think? Well, this is fascinating, and I was wondering about you know all these legends and so forth, and also the Ukraine was on my mind because I know that there's some you know talk about the Russians and the Rus people. You know, they're associated, you know, with Russia and yes. Moscow also coming from down there. Well, well, the, the Ukraine, the Ukraine is really the cradle of uh, the Russian people. Um, what, what happened was that at some point in the Middle Ages, some Vikings sailed down the, the river. I forget which river it was now, but sailed from the, the Baltic Sea down into the Russian interior, and they founded the city of Novgorod. And later on, they went, they went further down into the interior and founded the city of Kiev. And uh, this, um, they, 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 these, they, they, these were Scandinavian um, Vikings. And the dynasty, the dynasty that they founded was, was called the Rus dynasty, which is the origin of the word Russia. Uh -huh. So Kiev, Kiev was the, was the um, yes, the, the, the birthplace, really, of the, of the Russian people. Um, so it, it, it's rather, rather ironic um, what, what subsequently happened with, with the Ukraine. That's interesting. Do, do you think that, you know, these legends of the uh, civilization emanating from the north have a common origin, you know, between Russia? And I know the Greeks, um, uh, Hyperborea, it was uh, prominent in uh, Greek myth. Yes. And, and then the, the, later on, the, the Germans got this Aryan concept from someplace where northern yes. peoples. Are, the, are those all related? Yeah, they're all related. Um, re really, it started with a um, a Greek mariner called Pythias, who I think ar around the second se second century BC um, sailed out um, sailed out from the, the port of Marseille, which was then the Greek city of Marsalia, and he sailed out through the Straits of Gibraltar, uh, the, the pit pillars of Hercules, as it was then called and sailed out up into the far north. And he came eventually to a land that he described as a land of ice and fog. And this, this may possibly have been Iceland. We're not quite sure. But um, anyway, he called it um, Tula. Um, uh, the, Rom the Romans called it Ultima Tula. And... It also acquired the name Hyperborea, meaning the land beyond the north wind, Boreas being the north wind. So this, this notion of the, the mysterious northern land really captured people's imaginations. And um, various, various people have um, cottoned onto it. As, as you say, the Germans, the Germans cottoned onto it. There was a, a society in the pre-Nazi period called the, the Tula Society, which romanticized the, the, this notion of Tula, the, nor the northern paradise of the Germanic peoples. And the Russians cottoned onto it as well. 
And so, as I say, it's a, it's a very popular theme in Russia these days. And then we have UFOs and aliens uh, being tied into that, don't we? From the, uh, the, the uh, ancient giants and so forth from the north, other planets. Well, well, yeah, there have been um, various. There have been a number of Russian uh, Russian writers who have uh, claimed that the the Nordic gods were were in fact aliens from outer space. And um, some of the some of those artists that I that I mentioned who created these amazing scenes of the north of the Hyperborea, some of the some of them include extraordinary pictures of spaceships, uh, spaceships that, that, that have landed in this icy environment. So um, yes, it's all uh, it's, it, it's definitely got a science fiction science fiction dimension to it. <laughs> right. Uh, that Silver Age. Well, yes, your book, of course, has just so many examples of the esoteric and occult vibe of uh, Russia throughout history. But why don't we talk a little bit about modern times? There has been a pagan revival in Russia. How do you think it's going, uh, Christopher? Yeah, well, it's uh, quite a quite a strong and, and widespread movement. Basically, we're talking about two levels of, of paganism. There's the original indigenous paganism, which, which has always been there, partly in the form of folk traditions, folk, folk festivals, folk practices, the wor- worship of local gods, uh, household deities, and, and so on. And all of that has existed alongside orthodoxy um, in, in what, what the Russians call a dvoya veri, a dual belief, um, meaning people who have a foot in, in both camps. They, they um, would, would go to the Orthodox Church on Sunday, but at the same time they would observe these, these pagan practices. Um, the, the Orthodox Church was never terribly happy about it, but they, they somehow had a, ca- a kind of modus vivendi. <laughs> yeah. um, and there, was also, there are also indigenous communities in, in Russia that have been pagan, that have always been pagan. Um, for, for example, there's um, um, a, a people called the Mari who have their own republic. And um, they, uh, they have their, their own religion which they, they've been practicing since time immemorial. Um, by, by now, most of them have become converted to Christianity, but there's um, a, quite, a, quite a big percentage, percentage who've remained true to the old religion. And that the same is true of some of the Sami, the, the, um, the Lap people in northwestern Russia. Um, so that that that's the, the the original paganism. And Christopher, can we say that they are, uh, for lack of better words, they're animistic, shamanistic? Is that what can we say? Russian paganism is animistic, yes, and um, there's uh, a strong element of shamanism, uh, which, which comes in with the uh, well, the the, the the Sami are basically shamanistic, and um, the Mongol peoples of um, northeastern Russia, north, northeastern Siberia, uh, are shamanistic as well. So th- there's a strong shamanistic influence. But so that's, that's one level. The, the, the other level is uh, neo-paganism, which has sprung up um, mostly since the, the fall of communism. And um, this, is, this is quite a quite a big movement. Um, pe- pe- a lot of people are turning back to the old pre-Christian gods and um, going to ancient prehistoric sites. There's, there's one that's particularly famous called Arkaim in the Urals, uh, which, is, which has become a sort of Russian Stonehenge. And um, like, like at Stonehenge, 
thousands of people go there this the summer summer solstice uh, festival. And, and there are similar things going on at other other sites uh, uh, in Russia. There there are, there are now um, pagan priests who perform pagan ceremonies, pagan weddings, pagan burials, and so on. P pagan rites of passage. Um, so this is this is quite a quite a significant movement, I would say. Well, good to hear. I'm sure the 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 Orthodox Church must not be happy because once again they thought they were back for good and yes, <laughs> they, yes. as I said, they were the occult during the Soviet regime because they had to be underground. <laughs> and now they yeah. they came back and now it's like ah oh, these people. <laughs> yes, that's right. Connected to our ancestors in the land, how dare they? Yeah. <laughs> but also, what about uh, beyond the neo pagan revival? How has uh, New Age and the occult uh, worked in modern Russia? Do we see astrology and posters of Aleister Crowley more there in Russia, or what's going on, Christopher? Yes, well, uh, the, the, there is a New Age movement in Russia. Um, there are new age book, bookshops in um, Moscow and St. Petersburg and other cities, which look very much like esoteric bookshops anywhere in the world. You, you'll go into the one, one called the Stray Dog Bookshop. In, in, no, wait a minute. That's a, uh, that's a cafe. You know, um, can't remember the name. Anyway, if you go into one of these bookshops, you will see um books uh, translations of of books by western esotericists um like um Eliphas Levy um A E Waite um Alistair Crowley um one one of one of my own books was given the compliment of a pirate edition um my my book on Eliphas Levy um so um, there is a, a, a big importation of um, esoteric material from the West. Um, there, there, is a, there, is a, there is a Crowley movement in Russia. It's, it's numerically not very strong. It's probably in the hundreds rather than thousands. But there are, there are Thelemic groups in Russia, and um, Crowley's writings are, are read. Um, Astrology is very popular. There are professional professional astrologers. Um, the tarot is also very popular. So um, yes, the um, the new age is very much um, is very much present in Russia. Well, that's definitely good news to hear. Yeah, and of course, Alexander Dugin himself he's a chaos magician. So. There seems under Putin's Russia, there seems to be more of an openness, right? Or is the is is the church trying to, I don't know, uh, bring in some screws? Or that's it. The cat, the toothpaste is out of the, it's out of the tube, and that's it. <laughs> I think it. I think it would try to bring in some screws if it could, but um, at the moment, uh, at the moment, it hasn't done so. Well, good to hear. Yeah, and you also talk about uh, there is also a, uh, a feverish or at least high interest in Russians going back to rural rural life, getting connected with the land. And this was wasn't this sparked by a movement called the Anastasia? Yes, yes, the An Anastasia movement or the, the Ringing Cedars movement. Um, this is a very interesting story. There was. A businessman called Vladimir Megre, who was traveling. This was, I think, in about the uh, about the nineteen nineties or so. He was on a business trip um, in a ship traveling down the River Ob in Siberia, down to the Arctic Ocean. And at at some point, he stopped in a village, and there he met a woman, a very sort of radiant, beautiful woman called Anastasia, who lived in a cave in the forest nearby. And she took him off to this cave, and he spent several days with her. 
during which time she um, imparted a whole teaching to him, um, basically about how to live a more mean, meaningful and harmonious life in, in greater harmony with nature. And it, it, it included things like um, how to be self, how to practice self-sufficient agriculture, um, how to live a healthy, a healthy life, a teaching about family life, raising children, and so on, all of this. And he, he then went back to Moscow and wrote a book about everything that she had told him. And this book became a bestseller. And he, gave, he then gave up his business career and went on to write a whole series of books um, about uh, Anastasia's teaching. And this, this started a movement which has um, since spread to other countries. And it, it involves, the, the basic concept is the concept of homesteads of about two hectares each, which apparently is what you need to be self-sufficient. And these are grouped into communities. And um, many of these communities have now been established but both in Russia and, and elsewhere. So it's really caught on. Yeah, good to hear. And then, uh, yeah, Anastasia, you might say, falls under the woman clothed with the sun, Egregor. Well, I, 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 was exactly. she real? Or are we looking at like Carlos Castaneda making up Don Juan? <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think uh, you're, you're absolutely right in thinking that it's an Egregor. Um, the, 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 many, many people wonder who who Anastasia is, or if she even exists, right? because apparently he's, she, he's he's never produced her, so she's she's she's, she's never been seen except by him, and um, so uh, I mean a lot a lot of people treat this whole thing as as a fiction. So the question is, does she exist? Um, what, what I tend to think is that she is an example of this egregore, of the woman, woman clothed with the sun. And he somehow plugged into this egregore. And um, maybe in such a way that he actually perceived her as a, as a real human being. Um, and somehow received, uh, he somehow channeled this, this, um, this teaching. From her, whether 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 she's whether she's a real woman or an egregore, in in a way it doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. It's uh, it's always the results. And as you write, Christopher, another another important characteristic of Russian artistry and spirituality mm. is uh, that of magic realism, which is normal. And you know, when I lived in Mexico, Portugal. Uh, South America, it's no big deal, but it's also prevalent in Russia. And the example you give is uh, it's um, Mikhail Bulgakov's uh, Master and Margarita. That's one yes. of my wife's favorite novels, and she she yes. nags me. She's been nagging me for 10 years to read it. I think maybe it's time I read it. <laughs> oh, oh, you should. It's, it's an extraordinary book. Oh. Yeah. It's um, about what Satan comes to Moscow during Soviet rule or something like that. Yeah, well, it's it's two parallel stories. Um, the there's a, there's, a, there's a story in the present and a story set at the time of, of Jesus Christ, and um, the the story in the present is set in um, uh, in Stalinist Russia, and yeah, as you say, Satan appears. And um, causes all kinds of mischief and all, all kinds of very strange things happen, strange kind of magical happenings, and um, it's all um, it's all very fantastic and and, and unbelievable. Um, and it's sort of it is sort of poking fun. It's sort of poking fun at, at communist Russia. Um, but the, the parallel story. Um, take, taking place at the time of Jesus is, in contrast, very realistic, very sort of starkly realistic, and the the whole the whole events the whole event 
events of um, Jesus' life and crucifixion are very um, realistically described. So I, I think in, in a way it's, um, I think in a way it's, it's saying that the, the trying to draw, draw uh, con convey the message that the, the, the Stal Stalinist Russia is really a kind of fantasy world. Um, the, 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 the real, the, you know, the real world is the world of um, the, the world in which Jesus lived. Um, but it, it, you should definitely read it. It's very, very I amazing. Mm. <laughs> I will. I will now. It'll make my wife uh, very happy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah and uh, Vance, is, uh, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, uh, um, going back to the Russian lore and uh, legends and myths, um, mm. I've heard some things about Lake Baikal, you know, some mysterious things um, uh, surrounding that lake. Um, were there any legends, ancient legends, myths um, dealing with with Lake Baikal? Well, that, that whole area of Lake Baikal and the Altai is um, a very is a very special sort of region. Um, there's very strong very strong shamanistic tradition there, and um, I've I've heard the theory that. Um, you know, I, I was talking earlier about how there's a veil between the etheric world and the and the real world, um, and I've, I've heard it said that the Altai is a region where this, this veil is, is particularly thin, which could, could, could perhaps uh, perhaps account for the fact that there's so much there's, um, so much shamanistic activity there, and that it has this very um, that it has this great mystique, and that 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 region was also thought to be, um, it's it's one of the regions that where, where it's thought that um, Bielovodje was located. This this never never land that I talked about earlier, almost like a portal. To, you know, it's a, uh, yeah, it's like a portal exactly. Yeah, very good, wonderful, and. Um, couple more questions christopher yeah. one there's a quote in your book by charles clover who writes russia has always had the dubious distinction of being the conspiracy capital of the world what does that yeah. mean more than here the united states <laughs> well uh it's interesting that he he should say that um i think that there have been periods when um when conspiracy theories were rife uh one one period would have been um in the in the um last few decades of of uh, czarism the that sort of second half of the 19th century when um there was <clears throat> there were so many anarchist and terrorist groups around and Attempts on the Tsar's life and so on. You know all these all these little groups who were who were planning revolution. Um, and then and then I think again, I think again um, after Perestroika and and the fall of communism. I think that was another another period when conspiracy theories were rife. Um, because again, it was a kind of it was a kind of chaotic situation. Nobody knew how things were going to develop, right. and um, there was the the famous c uh, attempted coup, for example, uh, when when Yeltsin was in power. Um, and so the, the, these 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 kind of periods tend to breed conspiracy theories. Rumors, rumors start to spread, and um, also, um, it, it, actually, being a member of a conspiracy um, gives you, gives you a feeling of empowerment. <laughs> yeah. Um, but w whether it's more prevalent than in, in the United States, I don't know. Pro probably not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, these two countries can be pretty paranoid. 
Um, yeah. That's but um. So as we get towards the end of the interview, Christopher, mm -hmm. uh, could you explain to the audience uh, your last chapter about the Russian vision of the 21st century? What do you think it is? Uh, spiritually or politically, as you quote, Edgar Cay said that Russia, the hope of the world would come out of Russia. That's right. Yes. Yes. Um, well, Kay, Casey wasn't the only one. Um, uh, the, the, the German historian uh, Oswald Spengler said uh, quite an interesting thing. He, writing in the 1920s, he said that the Bolshevik regime was was merely a phase which was going to clear the way for a new age and in the book i i show a cartoon um illustrating spengler's vision of the new age and in the background is is a young woman who personifies the new age who's um, riding on a bear and behind her is a rising sun so so this, this again reminded me of the, the, the woman clothed with the sun. Um, so that, that was Spengler's prediction. And um, the, the philosopher Nietzsche also said something interesting. He said that of all countries, Russia is the one that has the strongest will, um, uh, which, which I thought was, was also interesting. And... Um, I think um, uh, I think it's true that the, the Russians do have a strong will. Uh, when, when, when you think that, when you think of all that they've been through, oh, yeah. um, Russia is sort of like a sword that's been forged in a, in a very hot furnace, um, and it, it's come out immensely strong. And um, so, I think um, what, one of the things that um, I think. Is, is strikes me about Russia is the the belief in absolute values. Um, I mean, this this ties in with um, what we were saying earlier about um, writers and, and artists and so on um, being being expected to convey a message. And um, I find that um, if you if you think of um, Writers, filmmakers, um, other other sort of leading leading cultural figures, they um, they they are eager to convey um, a message which has to, which has to do with, with values like wisdom, truth, beauty, and so on. Um, I mean, I, I read an interesting interview with the filmmaker Tarkovsky. Uh, where he was, he was talking about these things, and he said that that he regarded the the role of the filmmaker as to promote beauty, and he and he said um, the trouble with an artist like Picasso was that instead of nurturing beauty, he he in fact betrayed it. Um, well, how many how many filmmakers in the West would would talk about beauty in that way? Yeah, true. Um, so so um, people, people like Tarkovsky are not afraid to to talk in terms of these absolutes. I also use use the word enchantment. That um, the, the Russians have a sense of enchantment. The the the, the fire the figure of the firebird um, sum, sums it up very very vividly. That the, the life is is somehow pervaded pervaded by a, a sense of enchantment in a way that well when, when you think of the philosopher Max Weber who uh, talked about a disenchantment of the world um, he was writing I think about I forget around the turn, around the beginning of the twentieth century and saying that that the world had been disenchanted well. I think that's true. We are suffering from disenchantment in the West, and we um, we find ways of we find sort of ersatz ways of of finding it, like through um, Harry Potter, Harry Harry Potter films, and right. the to Tolkien, and so on. 
but um, it's not something that's sort of woven into uh, into the fabric of life. So I think I think maybe that's something that we can learn from the Russians. Those are some of the things I would say in terms of the um, what what might come out of Russia, you know, what what the kind of things that that, um, that Edgar Casey might have been talking about. Well said, yes, and you quote uh, writer Yuri Smirnov from the New Dawn magazine where he says that the Russian character includes spirituality, kindness, traditionalism, patriotism, and the need of a strong sovereign government. So that also adds to it. Yes. Wonderful. Well, we are at the end. Uh, uh, Christopher, uh, do you have a website or do you want to send the audience anywhere? And I'll have it, of course, in the show notes. I, I have a website. Um, I'll give you the, the address. It's www.osgard. That's, that's spelt O Z G A R D dot net, N E T. So www.osgard.net. And um, that will um, tell you um, all, all of my projects and, and so on. Wonderful. We'll check it out. And yeah, it's a very good read audience. I highly recommend you get Occult Russia. We only scratched the surface, but we are done. First, I'd like to say, Vance, thanks for uh, keeping us company. Oh, it's uh, been very educational and interesting. Uh, Makes me want to know a lot more about those guys over there. Hmm. Not unless you end up in a gulag. Don't go end up in a gulag. <laughs> there are. But no, yeah, yeah. Somebody had to say uh, some stereotype. But yes, we are at the end. Christopher, thank you very much for coming on Aeon Bite and giving us your time and your research on your excellent book, Occult Russia. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure for me, too. Pleasure as well. And there you have it, you shining crazy diamonds. Christopher's book is certainly a game changer when it comes to an understanding of the vast mysticism of Russia and much of Eurasia, ancient and modern. As mentioned in the intro, everyone gets this interview as it was an hour or so. The scheduling archons have been very active in 2023 for some reason. As mentioned too, And as a bonus for all subs, we have an engaging section from past interviews with Gary Lockman. Gary has put a lot of work on decoding the Russian soul and psyche. So get ready for his ideas on Rasputin, the Rus, Alexander Dugan, Putin, Egregores, Greek Orthodoxy, and so much more. So please support this Red Pill Cafeteria if you find value in this content. There are numerous ways to help grow this Gnostic revolution, and I certainly could use your assistance. Nobody here is getting rich by any means. I'm just a middle-class Gen Xer who wants to grow the reach of Gnosis in these hard times for the collective human psyche. I can't do it without you. And keep in mind the Virtual Alexandria Academy, which has been a success, and the feedback has been more positive than I could have ever imagined. Understand the Gnostic spirit with more than 20 easy-to-follow videos, downloadable assets, and cool quizzes. Other than that, let us to the bonuses if you are a sub on AB Prime, Patreon, Red Circle, or Rockfin. For the rest of you, Thanks for keeping us company in the desert of the real. Hello and goodbye, as always.